would actually be covering this uh, topic on preparedness, response, and risk reduction for hydrometeorological disasters. We know that uh, there have been floods happening in Greece, in Spain, in Libya, and in China. And in Libya, 2,000 people have lost their lives, and about 10,000 people are missing right now, and search and rescue operations are actually happening. So preparedness, response, and risk reduction for hydrometeorological disasters is extremely important. So we would actually be basically talking about uh, disaster typologies in the multi-hazard context because there is uh, a series of disasters happening ev every day in different countries, in different contexts. We would need to also recognize climate change as a threat multiplier. And climate change induced hydrometeorological disasters are, uh, need special attention. And we find that most of the disasters which are happening in the Asia Pacific region, uh, almost 80% of them are actually hydrometeorological disasters uh, triggered by climate change. Extreme events triggered by climate change and multi hazard preparedness and multi hazard early warning systems, MHEWS, we will be briefly discussing that. And then we will also look at emergency response and multi-hazard risk reduction, food security, water security, and energy security in the context of hydrometeorological disasters like floods, uh, cyclones, hurricanes, and landslides, and also drought. And we would also briefly talk about social engineering through capacity building and the role of platforms like teams. So some of the tipping points affecting human lives and livelihoods is the increasing frequency, magnitude, and numbers of people impacted and the economic damage caused by disasters, conflicts, extreme events, and climate change. And the widening inequalities among populations in both developed and developing countries and worsening poverty and deprivation among marginalized and weaker sections need to be addressed. Impact of climate change induced hydrometeorological disasters, which we can see from the floods in Greece, Spain, Libya, and China. And President Barack Obama said that we are the first generation to feel the impact of climate change and the last generation that can do something about it. So it has become really urgent. And climate change is a code red for humanity, so said the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Now, in terms of the disaster typologies in a multi-hazard context, we need to deal with geological disasters like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, hydrometeorological disasters like floods, cyclones, and also called hurricanes um, or tornadoes and drought, heat waves, snow avalanches, and landslides, and technological and industrial disasters, including oil fires, oil spills, and gas leaks, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear emergencies, CBR and emergencies, file, fire and wildfire, as we have seen also in many countries around the world. Conflicts which are happening, like the conflict of, uh, you know, which is happening right now because of the Russian aggression in Ukraine. Terrorism, which has also been happening in many countries around the world. Epidemics and pandemics and transportation accidents, which also need to be covered. But here we will be concentrating mostly on the hydrometeorological disasters and their preparedness, response, and risk reduction. Now, if you really look at climate change as a threat multiplier, we know that we recognize climate, global warming is happening, sea level rise is happening, glacier melting, desertification, extreme events, unprecedented rainfall, triggering uh, flash floods, heat waves, cold waves, air pollution, sandstorms, unprecedented rainfall triggering flash floods and landslides, cloud bursts, wildfires, and biodiversity threats and species extinction. All these are happening, which are uh, indicators of climate change, which is happening in front of everybody. And these are happening mainly because uh, these are human interference with nature, which is triggering these kind of disasters. So there is a school of thought which believes that uh, disasters are not natural disasters anymore. And they are mostly triggered by human origins and human interference with nature, which is called anthropogenic reasons. Deforestation, growth of plantations and monoculture, mining and quarrying, stone cutting often using explosives, sand mining from rivers, unauthorized construction in eco-sensitive areas, sediment, silt, and debris deposits in rivers, construction of dams and embankments, encroachment and diversion of wetlands, 
inadequate provision for solid waste management. And these are all happening, which are resulting in ecological degradation. And the use of plastics, we have seen that that is also creating a lot of problems and it is also becoming very challenging. Now, in terms of the hydrometeorological disasters, we need to recognize that they are processes or phenomena in atmospheric, hydrological, or oceanographic nature that may result in loss of life, injury, or other health impacts, damage to property, loss of livelihoods and services, social and economic disruption, or environmental damage and damage to critical infrastructure and assets. And in Asia, 81 weather, climate, and water-related disasters happened in 2022 of which over 83% were flood and storm events. More than 50 million people were directly affected, causing economic damages of more than $36 billion in 2022. And this is one of the recent reports from the World Meteorological Organization uh, titled State of Climate in Asia 2022. And we see that we have large numbers of people affected, 52 million people affected, more than 5,279 deaths in Asia and $36 billion damage and uh, from these 81 cases which happened in 2022. Now, geomorphology, hydromorphology, land use pattern, and all these can actually help in uh, providing inputs and data sets for scenario analysis uh, to really provide the better preparedness. And interferometric synthetic aperture radars, the INSAR, and differential interferometric synthetic aperture radars, DINSAR, and persistent scatter interferometric synthetic aperture radar, PS INSAR, can provide satellite imagery of deformations of critical infrastructure uh, by tracking them before, during, and after a disaster, like flood, earthquakes, or hurricane. And drones can provide information about the damages caused by hydrometeorological disasters. So we have different ways of ensuring that damage assessments can actually be carried out. Now, there's a report which has been prepared by SCAP, which looked at the progress of sustainable development goals uh, for the Asia Pacific in 2023. And this report showed that all the six, 17, out of all the 17 sustainable development goals, SDGs, uh, climate change is the only one which showed regress from 2015. When you really look at the period 2015 to 2030, we are in the mid ter mid term. That is, you know, we have completed more than seven and a half years on the 15 year time frame, and so we find that in this seven and a half years, we have actually regressed in the case of uh, climate change. But in all the other uh, 16 uh, sustainable development goals, we have shown incremental progress in most cases. We are not on track. And we find that you know we would really need to put in extra efforts. And the UN uh, Secretary General has been advocating for more funds to be deployed so that you know we will be able to improve the achievement of these goals, uh, even though they seem to be extremely difficult. Now, in terms of the extreme events triggered by climate change, we know that cloud bursts, flash floods, landslides, heat waves, sea level rise, air pollution, and many other extreme events are happening threatening lives and also threatening livelihoods, disrupting livelihoods. And many of the modern toolkits for early warning, which include IoT sensors, artificial intelligence algorithms, machine learning, uh, robotics and UAVs and drones, remote sensing and satellite imagery, modeling and scenario analysis, early warning, forecasting, alerts and alarms. And these are all possibilities to really look at strengthening our own preparedness. And Satellite remote sensing imagery can help in monitoring the situation before, during, and after the onset of floods. And digital elevation models and scenario analysis models can help in estimating the likely inundation and submergence, which may happen due to the release of water from dams or by excess rainfall. And the WMO, along with uh, the NDMOs, the National Disaster Management Organizations, and the nodal agencies for monitoring uh, meteorological data sets for alert and early warning, of potential hydrometeorological disasters are working on the multi-hazard early warning systems, MHEWS. And we know that we need to really understand the baseline of the multi-hazard context. We need to understand the uh, geomorphology and the hydromorphology and socioeconomic and demographic profiles and the multi-hazard risk identification, risk assessment to help in disaster preparedness and also disaster risk reduction 
community resilience building, and vulnerability reduction is important. Poverty reduction and vulnerability reduction of uh, marginalized and vulnerable sections. Capacity building, creative problem solving, and conflict resolution, grievance redressal, risk informed decision making, multi stakeholder engagement, interagency coordination, innovations and creative thinking, and frugal disruptions, including uh, solutions which are made through information technology and so on. So, preparedness means the state of readiness to deal with a threatening disaster situation or a disaster and its effects thereof. And preparedness consists of capacity building by conducting training programs, undertaking public awareness campaigns, carrying out mock drills and simulation exercises, establishing local village level task forces, establishing early warning systems, preparing disaster management plans, preparing stockpiles of sandbags in flood and cyclone prone areas, establishing community multipurpose shelters, identifying buildings for relief camps, etc. And we have this multi-hazard early warning systems, which are actually being worked together by multiple agencies, which are hoping that you know, we will actually have, as the Secretary General said, uh, we will have early warning systems for all by 2030. And there is a proposal to really uh, increase this uh, preparedness budget by 3.1 billion in four pillars. The first pillar is uh, disaster risk knowledge, 374 million. And second pillar is on observations and forecasting for $1.18 billion. And the third pillar is on dissemination and communication and $550 million. And finally, the pillar four is on preparedness and response, which is $1 billion. And this is for the next five years, you know, we are supposed to basically make sure that we will be able to work on this. So 20, uh, 2023, to 2027, uh, there is this proposal which has been prepared by the United Nations, by the WMO, and all these agencies which you're seeing on this slide. So we really need to strengthen our preparedness and early warning systems, which need to be providing alert and early warning messages. So in India, actually, we are working with different tools, including uh, the mobile applications and also software tools on the websites and we are also doing uh, not only forecasts, we are also doing now casting of rainfall so that we will be able to also see uh, the real time uh, local weather and situations. So we have the hyper local weather data analytics and granularity of microclimate and micro weather data, parametric risk insurance for climate change, big data analytics for predictive modeling, spatial temporal analysis of weather data and weather data based risk management, risk reduction and early warning and anticipatory governance using crowdsourced geoinformatics and data analytics, and data-led and evidence-based public policy analysis, and now casting of local weather monitoring, and crowdsourced interpretation through citizen science applications, and finally, geoinformatic solutions for informed decision-making. And we find that risk reduction is very important, and there's a report from the UNDRR which says that out of 130, $33 billion of official development, as, uh, which was allocated for disaster-related uh, aid between 2010 and 2019, only $5.5 billion was invested in measures to reduce uh, disaster risk and the uh, impact of uh, disasters. $5.5 billion out of $133 billion. For every $100 spent on disaster-related development aid, only $5.50 cents goes towards protecting development from the impact of disasters. And academic studies find every dollar invested in DRR, disaster risk reduction prevention, can actually result in savings of $3 to $15 in disaster losses. Investing in DRR is not attractive for most of the government leaders because these are disasters that don't happen. Distributing relief after disasters offers photo opportunities for politicians. And we need to really work also because hydrometeorological disasters uh, challenge food security, water security, and energy security in developing countries. Poverty, malnutrition, and deprivation continue to be serious challenges. And climate change induced droughts and famines are leading to food shortages. And groundwater tables are declining in most countries due to overexploitation of groundwater. Water intensive cash crops and monoculture results in water deficiency and gray aquifers. Rainwater harvesting must be promoted to conserve water. 
and just transition approaches to shift to new and renewable uh, energy resources must be promoted and excessive reliance on fossil fuels must be reduced and green mobility must be encouraged. Innovations in technologies for green mobility in public transport are also needed. And finally, we come to the social engineering through capacity building and role of platforms like Teams. Education for creating qualified emergency management professionals, distance education and international certification in emergency management like TQC and TQAC. Annual conferences and monthly webinars, experience sharing of good practice exemplars from different countries, like what we're seeing from India, China, Philippines, and the US in this session today. And multi-country consulting assignments with other academic and technical institutions across countries, publications and conference proceedings, and podcasts on contemporary problems. And we feel that sustainable development goals 2015 to 2030 out of the 17 goals, the last one, goal 17 on partnerships for the goals is very important. Inter-country, multi-country and trans-border collaboration is very much needed. So we hope that we will actually use this platform to continue to collaborate. And especially between countries like India and China, uh, and we need to really have this kind of collaborations and knowledge sharing. We need to have that. So I would conclude. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, this is Chiming Peng, and uh, I'm from Taiwan. And actually, this presentation is a uh, is a kind of the PPP, public private partnership. We work with the. Uh, uh, fire department of the new Taipei city government and also the new Taipei city government. And uh, our uh, uh, <clears throat> the other people join us is our meteorologist and also the fire department from the new Taipei city, especially the uh, Dr. Ching An Li. Uh, he is a commissioner of the new fire department of the new Taipei city government. I remember the, our founder, team's founder, the Kyle, uh, or had ever visit our uh, joined the uh, international conference before, and uh, I'm a meteorologist actually. I I from the academia, and later on I set up a, a weather company about twenty years ago. I serve lots of the client, and uh, beside that I have several role about the climate change and also the media, and I still keep the research job in universities. And uh, the weather risk is a weather company. Actually, it's very interesting because some country, only the government official have the rights to serve the uh, enterprise and also the government. However, uh, in Taiwan, uh, the, we uh, we modify the law, it's a meteorology law, and uh, the license, the government provide the license to private sector. So until now, in last 20 years, we reserve lots of the government, transportation, energy, technology, and also a lot of the outdoor events for that. And uh, uh, so such is kind of the weather information is very important because uh, uh, we should combine the meteorologists and also the uh, emergency people working together to serve the uh, accuracy weather information. Why is this so important? Because uh, we know this year, the uh, from the June to until the August, it's the uh, hottest summer uh, in, uh, until now. So the uh, UN Secretary General uh, Antonio said, uh, I remember in July, he, he said, it's not global warming, it's global boiling. And uh, last week he also mentioned because the, it's the hottest summer. So he, he said uh, it's a, a climate breakdown. That means uh, it's very dangerous because just the previous uh, Menon speak, Professor Menon also mentioned the climate change because the warming temperature means the heavy rain and also some drought event. And uh, another issue is uh, such as kind of global warming also bring lots of the billion dollars disaster year to year. So this year, uh, for, for example, the United States, they suffered 23 a billion dollar disaster until now. And also lots of the billion dollars. You, you can watch this, the billion dollars disaster. Most of them are frost. The frost means not only from the hurricane, but also from the sudden rain. So that's why I want to mention, for example, last week, the Hong Kong also suffered the uh, uh, sudden rain. Uh, the one hour rainfall intensity is about 150 millimeters. 
And uh, it's just very common in lots of the Asia city. For example, Hong Kong, you can see this is the traditional fire person uh, working to save the uh, people's life because the, the fraud are very serious uh, in one hour, one, uh, one hour, 150 millimeters. So it's a heavy rain. And the uh, new Taipei city uh, is uh, surround with the Taipei city. I, I think most of people can can we have ever visit Taipei and uh, the outside of the Taipei is a new Taipei city. Uh, it's about 4 million people uh, live there and uh, in Taipei Basin and this this side because we have lots of terrain and uh, uh, mountains so the it's very complicated to forecast the weather for example west side east side and also the the rural and urban side is totally different so the common disaster in new Taipei cities include the typhoon frost landslide and earthquakes and uh, how they can do it uh, because they they, they organize the uh, EOC emergency of control. And uh, this is the EOC managed by the new Taipei City Fire Department. And uh, that mission is to develop, to prepare for and respond to short duration intense rainfall incident. Be besides the, the fire events, the uh, extreme, especially the intense rainfall is very important. So every morning we provide, we work with the uh, uh, new Taipei City EOC Working together, we provide a, a weather prediction, especially the probability of heavy rain. Every 11 o'clock, morning 11 o'clock, we pro predict the probability of hourly rainfall reach, reaching 40 millimeters in each district of New Taipei City. So if we provide the information, the EOC will send a high risk warning notification to the district officers and also water conservation. So the fire and the emergency medical service dispatch center 119 and later on the fire station to activate warning monitoring and the related preparedness. So this is a, a, a schedule every day, especially during the summer events, we will suffer the uh, heavy rain. And uh, how we use the tools and a lot of the people, lots of the weather bureau will provide the national bureau will provide the weather information, but for the city level, they need more detailed information. So it's totally different. However, we still get the data from the uh, global mainstream numerical model. For example, the US GFS model and the ECU from the European Union, the ECMWF. And uh, this is the focus data of multiple mo models and the scales. And besides that, we also get the real time data from our government is a central weather bureau of Taiwan. And uh, they provide a lot of the data and also some academic research data to us. This is what we call, it's a regional model. And beside that, we also run in a high resolution wall focusing model. And its resolution is about three kilometers right now and uh, provide all of the information together. So our meteorologist, uh, serve the new Taipei city, we get all the data together and get the final result for the new Taipei city. And uh, because the thunderstorm during the afternoon is very important and uh, we use the NCDR, they have the criteria automatically made. For example, uh, it's uh, from the uh, it's the ability of the weather and the humidity and the wind direction and also the wind speed we combine all of the information together to get a criteria. Today, you will be heavy rain or not. And uh, because this criteria uh, already have about uh, 10 years uh, experience for this. So we modify it every yearly because such this kind of information can help us to identify today, well, heavy rain or not. So such this kind of criteria help the new Taipei city. For example, every day, just I mentioned 11 o'clock, we will provide information just this side. You can see, uh, for example, this is red light, it's a very warning, and another this side, very high risk location, the blue color. So this is the criteria is a 40 uh, millimeter per hour rainfall probabilities. So you can see this is a high risk and also the high risk and uh, some, some area is not so dangerous. And uh, later on, this is uh, in the early morning, and later on, the, ma the mayor shows because uh, at the, during the afternoon, the uh, heavy rain happened uh, until uh, uh, 1540. 
and a, a 66 millimeter of rainfall in Yinge district. So the mayor of Mr. Ho, Yo Yi Ho, also come here. And also the commissioner of the uh, fire department also joined us to discuss about the situation. So it's very important, give the information and uh, they have some action for that. So this is the evidence. This is a real life case in, in this August 10. And uh, as uh, in the at the four p.m., the hourly rainfall in Inge reach ninety millimeter. You can see the street, lots of the flood events there, and there were about forty cases of flooding were reported. They were most of the citizens will call the one one nine nine one one nine and uh, call the center. Oh, it's flooding! Please save me or oh, doing something. But the government actually already to initiate some kind of a of the criteria to help them to do that immediately. And uh, I think most of the people will ask me, what's the accuracy? Because before that, uh, it's a government to government. For example, the uh, our weather department is a from, is a from central department. For a local government, they, they're in charge for the citizen. So it's very important to help them uh, to make the accuracy more accurate. And this is our uh, validation and verification. For example, we use the, uh, we can say the heavy rain called SDIR forecast uh, from last uh, four years. And uh, we can see uh, this is probability threshold. And you can see, for example, we observe yes, and the forecast yes, this is yes, bingo. And uh, we observe no, and the uh, forecast no. So you can see this criteria and compared to all of the events together, it's a uh, 90, uh, 920. And uh, the accuracy is uh, approximately about 90%, 90%. So the accuracy is good enough, but we still have some missing. For example, some case, some case focus no and observe yes, still have some case. So we still have some uh, kind of the improvement, but actually such as kind of service is good enough to help the city level government to reduce the risk especially for the safety of the citizens. And uh, so my conclusion is the, uh, I think such is kind of process, you looks very simple and very easy, but it takes predict uh, the heavy rain will happen or not. And such is kind of accuracy uh, is about 90%, and which enables the, the emergency operation, the EOC to cooperate with the relevant agency in completing the rainfall disaster prevention and the response plan. We call, we have a plan about this. And uh, the false alarm is uh, 30%. And the future effort will, uh, will aim to reduce and optimize the efficiency of disaster uh, prevention resources. And uh, this heavy rain forecast provided by, by private weather company. However, the EOC can advance to uh, the plan and establish relevant standard operation procedure. For example, the pre-deploy personnel at high risk period and location. And uh, also implemented a pre appropriated disaster preparation measures, such as kind of major, for example, the activating the water pump, the water pump already there. So it's very easy to control the, the flood situation. Also controlling the traffic on dangerous roads and the pre dredging ditches, especially enhance the new Taipei city resilience against the heavy rain, rainfall, and also flooding. So such is kind of service, although you can look, it's small, but it's very important to help the citizen to reduce the risk and also help the city resilience. So uh, such is kind of service is uh, from, is by the public-private partnership. I think it's very good uh, story uh, from the city level, uh, New Taipei City, and also fire department of the city, New Taipei City government. So I, I would like to share this uh, good example. Hope you can, we can discuss in the future. And uh, such this kind of experience is also uh, good for many cities. And right now, I just, I know many cities come to the New Taipei City. We welcome all of you can join us. Uh, although this is small, but it needs lots of the experience, especially the meteorologists and also fire department, how we can work together. So I think it's very important. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for those who are on a different time zone. First of all, I'd like to thank 
uh, the teams, Dr. Harold and Dr. Tainlich, for giving me this opportunity to give a presentation on the implication of global nursing shortage in healthcare continuity. I also would like to thank Dr. Jaime Almora, the uh, board of director at the Philippine Hospital Association in the Philippines for uh, co-authoring this presentation with me. Uh, Dr. Tienrich, may we start on slide five, introduction, please? As UN members state, aspire to achieve universal health coverage, it has become obvious that with the status of global nursing shortage, healthcare continuity is compromised. The universal truth is that there is no health without a workforce. The push and pull factors, brain drain, COVID-19 pandemic, economic factor, and lack of nursing educators have critically impacted healthcare system. The supply and availability of nurses in many countries remain insufficient to deliver essential health services and ensure that the poor and marginalized people in Africa and Southeast Asia have equitable access to healthcare. According to the World Health Organization, it is only when the healthcare force is equitably distributed and accessible by the population, possesses the required competency and empowered to deliver quality care that is acceptable to the sociocultural expectation of the population and adequate supported by health system can theoretical coverage translate into effective coverage. Slide six, please. Continuity of care is the process by which the patients and healthcare professionals are involved in an ongoing healthcare management toward a shared goal of high quality and cost effective medical care. The continuity of care reduces fragmentation of care and improves patient safety and quality of care in all settings through coordination of care with other healthcare professionals. According to Benjamin Franklin, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. In the past decade, an estimated 2.6 billion people around the world have been affected by disasters. Nurses are pivotal in safeguarding the public during and after dis disasters. Nurses help in disaster response foster community resilience and care for patients in the hospital. The increasing frequency of natural and environmental hazard from the effect of the climate change, along with global public health emergency, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, unveiled the critical need for a nursing workforce prepared with the knowledge and competency to respond and care for the people in the community and patients in the hospital. Slide seven, please. According to the World Health Organization report, an estimated 27 million men and women make up the global nursing and midwifery workforce, which is nearly 50% of the global health and workforce. The largest global shortage of nurses and midwives are in Southeast Asia and Africa. To achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goal number three, on health and well being, the World Health Organization estimates that the world will need an additional 9 million nurses and midwives by 2030. Investing in nurses is a good value for your money. The UN High Level Commission on Health, Employment, and Economic Growth concluded that the investment in education and job creation in health sector result in triple return of improved health outcomes global health security and economic growth. Eight, please. In 2020, the World Health Organization State of the World Nursing Report showed that 89% of nursing shortage were concentrated in low and lower middle income countries with gaps in the African and Southeast Asia World Health Organizational regions with an estimated shortage of 7.2 million health workers worldwide by 2035. The nursing shortage is described as an imbalance between demand for employment and available supply, which vary on geographical location and nursing shortage. There are two types of nursing shortage, 
a real shortage and a pseudo shortage wherein there are enough nurses, but not enough willing to work under available nursing conditions. The demand factors are aging population, globalization, and growing private sector with increased trust in nurses, migration of nurses, brain drain, infectious diseases such as COVID-19, HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, whereas the supply factors include unfavorable work environment, for example, high workloads, inadequate nursing support staff, burnout, wage disparities, and lack of retention strategies by human resources. Nine, please. The economic theory argues that income level is the most significant factor in the push and pull of nurses from one job to the other. Drennan and Ross describe the factors that influence the nurse's decisions, such as the individual skills and interests, job characteristics, financial benefits, for example, health insurance and pension, organizations such as private, public, clinical, and reputation. In location, whether it be urban, suburban, rural, and proximity to family. The United Kingdom, United States, and Australia host the most migrant nurses. Australia accepted 11,757 foreign nurses between 1995 and 2000, and more than 10,000 foreign nurses obtained an uh, H1 visas according to the U.S. Immigration and Natural Resources. UK accepted 26,286 foreign nurses between 1998 and 2002. 40 countries represent the nursing workforce in Saudi Arabia. The American Hospital Association estimate a cost of 30,000 to 64,000 to recruit a single nurse in the United States. However, contracted nurses are obligated to complete their tenure which saves the hospital long-term costs. According to the U.S. Joint Commission 2002 report, hiring trained foreign nurses does not solve the global nursing shortage because countries that send nurses abroad face nursing shortage and strain in their own country. Then, please. In 2020, on the occasion of the World Health Day and 200,000, 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale, the founder of modern nursing, Dr. Poonam Kitrapal Singh, regional director for Southeast Asia, stated that the Southeast Asia region needs to redouble efforts to expand their nurse and midwives by 1.9 million to achieve health for, for all by 2030. The theme of the World Health Day was to support and strengthen the nursing and midwifery workforce. To fill the gap, Dr. Singh recommended that we need to increase the number of nurses and improve nursing education, improve the number of jobs for nurses, their quality and distribution in rural and marginalized area, and enhance leadership and management. To resolve the nursing shortage in Singapore, the country has recruited nurses from the Philippines, the People Republic of China, India, and Myanmar. Um, Singapore attempted to train, re recruit, and retain local nurses by improving work conditions and salary, raising the profile of nursing, improving career recognition, and encouraging non-practicing nurse back to the workflow the workforce. However, the efforts of the government were met with limited success. The nursing shortage in Singapore was compounded by major healthcare challenges such as rapid growth in population, rapid aging of the population, and increasing burden of chronic diseases. 11, please. Now I'm going to discuss about the nursing shortage in the Philippines. According to an article published by Bloomberg in 2022, many countries are stepping up efforts to lure foreign nurses by promising expedited visa and higher pay. 
no nation is better prepared to help the world staff up its hospital than the Philippines, the single largest exporter of nurses. Germany, United Arab Emirates, and Singapore are increasing their efforts to recruit foreign nurses from the Philippines. Germany's government announced that it wants to recruit 600 Filipino nurses for hospitals and elderly care centers and offered qualified applicants with free travel expenses, accommodation, language training, bonus upon passing the exam on first try. Singapore and the Philippines opened talks on hiring more Filipino nurses. The UAE offered golden visas, which would allow nurses to live in the Gulf nation for 10 years without a sponsor to the front line in the pandemic fight. According to PINMA Corporation that operates many schools in the Philippines, the number of freshmen for its four-year nursing program has spiked to nearly 400 percent since 2019 to about 6,000 students exceeding its projected target for 2005. The uniform services of the government, such as police, army, bureau of fire protection, jail, are now the highest paid workers in the government, and they give preferential acceptance to nurse applicants. There are now about 10,000 nurses in the, Philippi in the Philippine um, force alone, the PNP, which means that this is an example of a pseudo need for nurses, meaning that there are lots of nurses, but yet these nurses are not practicing their expertise in nursing. The average salary of nurses in the hospital in the Philippines is about 20,000 pesos per month, while the entry salary for the uniform service is 35,000 per month. Other employers of nurses are in the business processing office and pharmaceutical agents uh, company. The COVID pandemic also caused many nurses to resign. There is a surge of hospital constructions which compete with the available supply of nurses uh, between the government and the private entities. 12, please. The South African health system is comprised of a public-private mix characterized by entrenched maldistribution of resources dating back to the apartheid era and with inefficiency and inequity that contribute to falling short of the health millennium development goals. It is projected that by 2030, the African region, um, we're now on slide um, 12. My apologies, it stopped uh, moving. Just give me oh, one, just oh, give me it's one. Okay. It's one, one second. Can I go ahead and talk? Yes, please go ahead. It is projected that by 2030, the African region would need an additional 6.1 million healthcare workers. To reduce the current shortage of health workforce, Africa needs to educate and train 3 million additional health workers by 2030. Africa was short of 600,000 nurses in 2006, while Ghana has 4,000 nurses but needs 10,000 more. Zimbabwe has the money to hire 2,000 nurses if they could find the nurses. There were 30 nurses to cover a 1,000 bed hospital, while there has been one or two nurses per 100 patients in Uganda, a situation that is common in other African countries. The annual exodus of South African nurses appeared to be eight times that of foreign qualified influx. One of the significant factors that contributes to nursing shortage in the sub-Saharan Africa and South Africa is due to the incidence of HIV, AIDS among professionals, while the under-reporting of incidence of exposure is due to lack of awareness, inadequate documentation, human error, and lack of personal protective equipment. Okay, five the minutes South, left. 
Okay, the South African health system is comprised of a public, okay, sorry. The focus on human resources for health has increased as part of 2011 strategic plan driven by high burden of HIV, tuberculosis, and maternal and child disease. Although it was observed in 2010 that South Africa has a shortage of more than 44,700 professionals, nursing was only added to the list of critical skills late in 2022. Some of the factors that contributed to the nursing shortage are inadequate training and student output, unable to fill open position, aging workforce, push and pull factors, and poor working condition that's worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the South African Nursing Council, the nurse to patient ratio is one to six, which highlights the depth, the depth of the crisis. Addressing the nursing shortage requires a coordinated and collaborative approach from the South African government, civil society, and private sector with temporary employment service providers to promote healthcare continuity and avoid the collapse of the healthcare system. Although TES should be brought in as a last resort, it is critical to bear in mind that patient care is the top priority which would trump all other consideration and that TES providers can assist in sourcing foreign skilled health workers to, boost, to bolster the medical sector until training and student outputs recover. Although most South African hospitals have their own nursing colleges, only designated universities can issue professional nursing qualification. According to NetCare CEO Richard Friedland, South Africa has an estimated shortage between 26,000 and 62,000 nurses with a large number expected to retire. NetCare has the capacity to train over 3,500 nurses per year. However, it is only accredited to take 10% of that number. The impact of nursing shortage, a low and I'm 14, please. A low nurse to patient ratio at the hospital setting results in increased patient burden on nurses, increased risk of errors, which com compromise patient safety, increased risk of adverse outcomes such as fall, urinary tract infections, and decubitus ulcer. Burnout and an increase in turnover, turnover will lead to higher costs for employers in the context of HR and nursing unit orientation. Recommendations to alleviate the shortage are 15, please. The World Health Organization asked the countries and institutions to ensure that they use ethical recruiting standards so that they do not drain nations of critical personnel. Government must spend more to increase wage and educate and train new nurses domestically since the in the Philippines, since the Philippines cannot simply supply nurses for the rest of the world. South Africa should invest more in nursing education and nursing leadership, provide hospital employees with awareness and educational training on HIV AIDS and other infectious disease, provide employees with adequate supply of personal protective equipment. Other recommendation to alleviate the nursing shortage in slide 16, please. The government in the Philippines should consider providing subsidy for higher salaries of nursing educators and clinical instructors, improve the morale of nurses in the workplace as part of retention strategy, consider a paradigm shift to embrace the concept of shared governance and consider nurses as contributors to the health organization, which can improve nursing morale. To promote healthcare continuity, the health system should address the various factors that impact global nursing shortage by having adequate supply of nurses and midwives responsive to the population needs with aligned demand and supply with effective government policy governance that respect the rights of the nurses who are dedicated to care for the population in the community and in the hospital and receive adequate pay and provide stewardship and financing for shared national and global prosperity, health and wealth. Thank you very much for your, um, for your time in listening to this presentation.